One of the biggest issues of people when they're studying the Bible is they often miss what's really truly going on in the text. I think we've almost been taught to read it as if we're there in person, as if we're part of the crowd hearing Jesus teach. And the problem is, is that we weren't there. We are from a completely different time, a completely different culture. So today we're gonna talk about one of the biggest issues I see in lay people today. Let's begin. So I recently filmed a video watching Mike Winger's first episode of his series on women in ministry. And in that video, I mentioned a couple things about Bible interpretation and context clues and cultural distance when we're reading the Bible. And I got a lot of comments of people saying, well, you have to read the Bible literal. If you just read the Bible literal, you wouldn't be asking these questions. If you just open the Bible and read what it said and valued the Bible faith, you would never ask these questions. Let me just first say, if the church is not a safe place to ask questions, then what is the church? As members in the church, we should know that there's no safer place to ask questions than in the church, but that's a video for another day. So I've got my notes here from Principles of Exegesis. It was a seminary class I took. I think it was like my first semester of seminary. And I kind of wanted to walk you guys through just literally my notes and what I took here on how to read the Bible because I often fall short in my wording and people are starting to get really critical of what I say in my videos. So let me just read what my notes said. Obviously we know hermeneutics is how you approach the scriptures to then interpret and draw an exegesis or a message um, and application out of it. We believe the scriptures have authority, which means that whatever they say should dictate over our lives or should lead us to action, should inform the way that we live, etc. right? We believe that they're inspired. So this is the word of God, right? Capital W. It's got the influence of the Holy Spirit. While there were human people writing the scriptures through very human means. Uh, where's my book? This book changed my life and the way that I read Pauline epistles and really understand the way that the early church letters were shared. So check this book out if you wanna hear more about like the human means that were used to collect, distribute the scriptures, right? So we believe that God used human means, human authors, maybe even possibly people correcting, checking, whatever, spell checking, but we believe that at the end all, they are inspired. I have here in my notes, Scripture leaves the mode of inspiration uncertain. We don't know how. Did God dictate it? Paul used his mind and inspiration is described as plenary. Every part of it, not just as a whole, is inspired and, and inspiration is also described as verbal. Even the very words, not just the concepts. So essentially what we're saying here is we hold to this idea that scripture, what some call the autograph or the original documents of scripture, they have authority, they're inspired by God. So whether he dictated it or whatever, at the end all be all, what we have in that original document, that is God's inspired word from him, chosen, used. We were the handwriting, but it was him that directed the thoughts, directed the words, directed the sentence structure, etc. And based off of that, we get this theology of inerrancy. Inerrancy is this really complex idea that people, lay people especially, tend to draw this idea of, well, you approach your scriptures as, and you interpret them literally. So inerrancy, oftentimes people think, well, okay, that means you open up your Bible and you interpret everything literally. But at the end all be all, when scripture says in Psalm 91, the wings of Yahweh, we know he doesn't actually literally have wings, even though we say you interpret the scriptures literally. We know that that's a meta for right and this happens all the time and then on top of it we know it's a literary book so we know that there's going to be poetry or songs there's going to be tons of metaphors there there's going to even be hyperboles and symbolism okay so like for example in first kings 12 10 this is one of my favorite examples of like funny bible stuff kings are verbally battling and one says to another how does he say my little finger my pinky finger is thicker than my father's waist and that is a nice way of saying, my pinky finger is bigger than your manhood. Now we've changed that. We've made it a little bit more socially acceptable, but that is like literally what they were saying to each other. They're threatening and saying, my pinky finger is bigger than your manhood. That's kind of funny. Can we just admit that? Now he wasn't being literal. He wasn't being, I don't know, anatomically descriptive there, but he was using hyperbole. He was using metaphor. I mean, there was a lot of different literary elements there. So I'm not a huge fan of saying, we interpret the Bible literally every single time. No, inerrancy should be understood as the original documents 
I had no errors. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't contradictions, as I like to say tongue in cheek. For example, like I said, Kings and Chronicles have a ton of even numerical contradictions, but that doesn't mean that they don't serve a purpose, so that there isn't some kind of explanation behind them. We would say inerrancy means that the Bible is truthful in all that it affirms. The Bible is truthful in all that it says. But what does it say? We know that there are differences in manuscripts. We know that there are differences in even translations. No two ancient manuscripts are even identical. That's where textual criticism comes from. And that's when scholars look at two different manuscripts and they try to identify, okay, well, this one must have been copied off of A and B, and this one must have been copied off of B and C. And there's like this whole scholarly world off of that. And it doesn't really matter. We have a really great document, right? But at the end all be all, inerrancy isn't God said it, so I'm just gonna believe it. I'm just gonna take what it says at face value and use no interpretation, no common sense to try and understand what's going on here. I have here in my seminary notes, inerrancy should never be used to short circuit the process of interpretation. Inerrancy isn't a hermeneutic or method of interpretation. It just says that if you interpret it properly, it is true. That means to say, we have to do that groundwork of interpreting, of doing the back background research, you know, with books and reading and asking hard questions. Now, when you do this, that can completely transform how you understand a passage. Turn with me to the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. It's verses like three through eight. And there, there's a really high standard for holiness, for God's people. I mean, this is a passage that we all know very well. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the da -da. Blessed are the da -da. Da -da. Like we all use this passage. We all know of it. But if you really, truly look at what it says, you might completely get a different idea of what was going on there because of your cultural distance, because you're reading the Bible here in 2022 or whatever you are, and you have no idea what the people are doing there, who Jesus is talking to, what Jesus' concepts are, whatever. We can't read Jesus' mind. So our due diligence here is to open the Bible and ask, okay, what is the context clues? What is the message? What is the arc of Jesus' sermon of sorts? And where is he going with this? And so I recently sat down for my Patreons, my husband and I, and we filmed a Bible study on the Beatitudes. And I'm gonna insert some clips here so that you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about of how knowing background information can completely change your understanding of a passage and make it so much even richer and better. Let's go. Hey Patreons, welcome to this week's Bible study. This week I thought it would be really powerful if we talked through the Beatitudes. This is the Sermon on the Mount. So he's speaking to the Am Ha Aretz, it's people of the land is what that means. And so these are the people that are the poorest of the poor. They don't have jobs. So that's why they're here in the middle of the day listening to Jesus speak and they're hungry as we'll later find out. It seems like he's really honestly kind of getting to their identity. But let's begin with blessed are the poor in spirit. So Jesus is on top of a, of a hill, the crowds gathering around him and he's teaching from this sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit. So this isn't supposed to say poverty is piety or poverty is righteousness. It is a blessing for those who have sustained poverty and still choose to have confidence in him and still choose to have confidence in God, and still choose to find their identity in God. It's not in their lack of land ownership. It's not in their inability to provide food for their mouths and their family. It's whose identity is placing God, not their identity here on earth. Yeah, so it's kind of similar with like blessed are, it says poor in spirit. It doesn't say poor materialistically. It doesn't say choosing a vow of, of poverty, material poverty for monks and that sort of thing. It's a spirit of poverty. And so it's the way that you approach God's word. It's the way that you approach your relationship with him, coming to the scriptures, coming poor in spirit and needy, knowing that you find something within him. Now you see through that simple, quick Bible study, that little snippet of the Bible study that I did with my Patreons, that knowing that background information of the Am Ha'arez, those, those people of the land, knowing the background information of who Jesus is talking to completely brings that text to life because we understand that he's talking to the poor. We understand that he's talking to the humble. We see that he's talking to the weary, to the mourning, to the very people that he is describing and he's calling them to 
turn from their brokenness and trust in him to be the solution for all of their brokenness, for all of their needs, and that he himself has everything they need for true living. And that, my friends, is how you look at the background information and just knowing a snippet of information on that background information can open your eyes and ears. Now you might ask, okay, where do I go for that kind of information? And in that case, I encourage you to watch this video here. I will take you through all the resources that I would encourage you to use. It's not simple, this is the hard work, but this is the really fulfilling, beautiful work. And I'll see you guys in this video. Bye guys.